All right, and we'll give a couple minutes for everyone to join. I see people trickling in. Happy Wednesday. I was about to say Tuesday, a little bit clunky with the days. I <laughs> not sure what day of the week it is, but we are here. <laughs> um, awesome. And if you want, go ahead and drop where you're from in the chat. Um, thanks for joining. We're excited to host this webinar with Ryan. Um We'll wait a couple more seconds here. Got some people all over the place here. I am in Southern California. Awesome. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you guys for joining. We're so excited to be doing these expert-led webinars. Um, we at Herd like to host this as a resource for you as a therapist. Um, whether or not you're a Herd customer. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Herd, Herd serves as a financial back office for therapists. So we help you with your payroll, taxes, bookkeeping. Um, so if you're looking for tax service for the, I always get tripped up on this, the 2023 tax season, <laughs> then uh, where are your guys? Um, but really excited to welcome Ryan here to talk about financial planning for therapists. Um Brian, I'll go ahead and let you take it away. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Brittany. Heard, appreciate it. Um, you can't see anyone's faces, but I'm excited to you know virtually meet you and uh, talk a little bit about financial planning today. Uh, before we get started, though, I have a, a quick question. And uh, Brittany, if you don't mind man manning the chat here, just because I can't, I'm sharing my screen. But yeah. um, my question is, how much financial education did you have growing up? Um, you know, some people have had some, some people have never. I'm curious uh, from, you know, the participants' experience. Yeah, we are seeing a lot of very little to none to some super common. I would say the same for myself, very little. Yeah, I remember maybe around sixth or seventh grade having a class where it was like life skills and I learned how to write a check and trade a stock. Uh you know, none of, neither of two I use much to this day, honestly, because I don't write many checks and I don't trade individual stocks. Um, but the fact uh, is like so many of you are incredibly highly educated, uh, have gone through years and years of school. And yet I bet none of those classes or whatever sort of talk about one, the personal finances, but also running the business unless you were in an MBA or something like that. Um, and so really today we'll talk a little bit about sort of financial planning and how uh, we kind of bring some education and some knowledge to you, uh, the business owner that, you know, we frankly haven't had growing up. Uh, so we'll hit on a few different um, topics. You know, you can sort of see, uh, you know, here what we're going to hit on between the cash flow, the structure, the taxes, retirement planning, succession planning. And really the goal is at the beginning, we'll talk a little bit about stuff that impacts more um, beginning practices. And then stuff gets a little bit more complicated, a little more complicated as things go on. And so we'll talk a little bit about sort of how to evaluate those. Um, and maybe like one or two things within each um, which within each uh, slide. And of course, I, I think Brittany mentioned, but if you have any questions for me as we're going along, throw it in the chat. She's uh, monitoring monitoring it, so she'll let me know um, if if anything comes up. Yes, I um, will I will hop on in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, and so here's a picture of uh, me, my non-bearded face uh, from a few years ago. So, um, but basically I work with therapists and their families, um, while they're, you know, building their business, I'm basically allowing them, um, time to work with clients while we're managing the finances. And the question that often comes up when I, I'm talking to someone is, you know, why are you working with therapists? Um, and it's kind of a long winding road, but essentially that education that I lacked growing up. I got as a journalist. I worked for a journalist for many years. And from the get-go, I was in financial journalism, working for publications like Money, Fortune, where I actually covered financial planners. So in that experience, I not only learned what type of attributes make for good financial planning engagements, 
but also the things that clients and whatnot should look for. Um, and so when I sought to go out on my own uh, and work one-on-one -on -one with people in a more direct way, as opposed to writing, which is kind of like in a hubby hole somewhere, um, I, I looked towards financial planning. I also uh, worked for myself for uh, 10 years, 10 years or more. Um, and so I understood a lot of the self-employment concerns, issues. I've gone through a lot of the questions you probably have in your own private practice. Um, but as I was reaching out to people who were self-employed, a group that I not only connected with, but I saw a real need were therapists. Um, and basically just from that conversation that we started with, because they they never had those classes. They never learned the business because they were so focused on learning their profession and as they should have been. Uh, but uh, I, where I fill that void is trying to provide some uh, financial knowledge to that private client or that private practice space. And so that's that's really how I've come to work with therapists. I love it. Uh, and uh, you know they're the majority of my clients to this day. And uh, by the way, I work for a group called United Financial Planning Group in uh, Long Island, uh, but we work with people all across the U.S. So let's uh, let's get into the nitty gritty of the finances. Um, I am sure this is something that many of you have uh, thought about, wondered about. Um, how do you manage cash flow of the practice? For some of you, you may still be going through this. For some of you, you may have found some sort of balance. Um, but when you're starting out, this is always going to be the number one concern. And the main reason that it becomes such a concern is because of that sequence of cash flow risk. Uh, what this is, is when you work for yourself and you have clients, they per pay you at a certain time during the month. But meanwhile, you have expenses that come at the same time each month. And so while you're waiting for you know, funds to come in, profits to come in, revenues to come in, those um, expenses are hitting every time. And so if you have slow months, it doesn't impact it doesn't impact the expenses. The expenses aren't slowing down because you're having slow months. Um, and so this sequence of cash flow risk becomes really pressing until you have developed a plan and strategy to kind of get past this. Um, even for those who have developed a fairly sizable practice, if they haven't properly managed this step in the process, it can make them feel cash poor. So you could say like, I'm making $200,000 in revenues and still not feel like you have a whole lot to work with because you don't have the protections in place on the cash flow front. And so often the time, oftentimes when I'm working with clients, one of the first things we're doing is managing this um, aspect. Um, to do that, uh, you know, you've probably heard uh, before that you need to build an emergency fund. Uh, I am a big proponent of having one on the personal side and one on the business side. Um, you know, we like to think of our business as this entity separate from our personal lives. We develop, we get an LLC, we get an S Corp or whatever, and we say, hey, uh, this is my business and then my personal life is something else. But when you are your own um, owner and you run your own practice, it's impossible to avoid uh, that sort of overlap because what happens if you need to put on a new roof um, and you suddenly need $15,000? How are you getting that? Are you getting it from your emergency fund in your personal account? Are you tapping your business account? Um, if you're tapping your business account, are you suddenly feeling worse about your uh your business and your finances because of it? Are you taking on uh, clients that may not reach your fee structure because of it, because you just need the cash? Well, that so much for that separation of the personal and business in that case. Um, the same can happen on the business side. You know, things slow down, suddenly your, your personal finances look uh, a lot tighter. And so what we work to in like the beginning is really building those three to six months on both the personal side and the business side. So we're protecting against those things. Um, one way we start to do that is we look at your expenses. And so we dig into the expenses that you're spending both on the personal side and business side to determine how much do you need to cover your lifestyle. Um, 
from your business. And once we find that amount, that that's your salary. Even though you work for yourself, you should give yourself a salary. Um, I know a lot of like new private practice owners kind of look at it as um, whatever I make, I'm going to pull out of the business and, and start funding, you know, new cars or whatever. But you can't do that uh, until you have those emergency funds in place, um, because you're never going to be able to kind of grow your cash to a point where you're fully protected unless you kind of show some self-control on this salary front. Um, and so that's a big part of the initial conversation with people is understanding that salary, developing a plan for payment um, to yourself in that way. Uh, so you can create that safety net that we're talking about here. Uh, Brittany, were there any questions there? I just wanna make sure I'm not ignoring anything. Nope, just some positive positive reactions and feedback. So thanks for going over this, super oh, helpful. Thank you, thank you. So uh, hopefully this will bring in um, some, some response. Uh, I'm curious in, in terms of folks out there, what type of business structure do you all have? Do you have an LLC, a PLLC, or an S Corp? S Corp, LLC, PLLC. We got a good mix of people here. Sole proprietor. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So often, what I find in the therapy space is there's like, um, you, you know, you have the finances and the business, but you also have to worry about your regulator you know, the state regulations, uh, HIPAA, that sort of stuff. And a lot of times the state is going to require you some sort of business structure. So I often see an LLC or a PLLC. Um, and today I just kind of want to talk about some of the differences because, um, you know, I think sometimes people get stuck on one or the other, but we'll talk a little bit about the benefits and downsides of both. Um, so the LLC or PLLC, I'll just kind of go through the slide a little bit. Uh, what they do is they separate the business from the personal, from a legal perspective. Um, so let's say you were to get sued uh, for something, um, you know, I'm sure it wouldn't be for the, you know, the, the service that you provide, but something else. You can actually protect, uh, say, your home in a lot of cases, in, if that was the case. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak, you know, fully to that, but that's really the purpose of the LLC. Um, but there's another value to the LLC in that you can build business credit over time. And so um, one thing that people do when they're starting out is if they want a loan, if they want anything like that, it's really just based on their personal credit score, their personal credit history. But as businesses grow and grow in size and say they want to become a group practice and okay, now we're looking at build, like buying a commercial uh, outlet of some sort to house this group practice, they will need to take out loans. They'll need to take out commercial loans, uh, that sort of thing. Um, the more you can build business credit, the more you can leave a lot of the risk of those decisions to the business as opposed to the personal assets. And that could be highly valuable over time. Uh, it's not a short-term thing. It takes a long time. But uh, getting started with that today is, you know, is really, really important. Um, the On the S-Corp side of things, it really provides all the aspects of an LLC or a PLLC, but what it does is it separates you as both the employee and the employer of a business. And so now you're giving yourself a salary as the employee, but also paying yourself as an employer. And this is really important because I'm sure you all know you have to pay self-employment taxes. And self-employment taxes are essentially what uh, fund Social Security and Medicare. And when you work under house somewhere, like in a um, in a business, there your employer is paying half of that amount. Uh, but when you work for yourself, you're paying all of it. It's fifteen point three percent. And so uh, when you're separating yourself as employer and employee, you have to pay the self-employment tax on the employee side. So whatever you pay yourself as employee, uh, you have to pay that 15.3%. But what the IRS says is you only have to pay yourself um, essentially what you would typically make in that, space, in that space. So if you make more than that, then you can pay yourself as employer. And then on that employer side, you don't have to pay that 15.3%. And so that can be, you know, depending on the size of your income, thousands of dollars in savings 
especially as your income grows, uh, where you may have to pay even additional Medicare tax because above certain limits, you have to pay even more Medicare tax. So you can kind of limit that in that way. And so it's really important in that, that front. Now, what I often see from less scrupulous um, CPAs is they will put people into S-Corps right from the beginning. And they may even say, you know what, we're, we're going to give you a salary of like $20,000 and everything else is going to be, uh, you know, the uh, ownership take. Uh, the problem with that is one, the IRS may eventually say, I don't know about that. But the other problem is like, these are social security and Medicare. Uh, and that's what funds your social security and Medicare. And so by doing that, you're saying you're avoiding your social security. And so you're not growing your social security uh, value through the years. And so one part of like my job on the planning side is to evaluate what would make sense as a reasonable salary uh, that will also address whatever else is going on in your assets, how much you know investments you have, how much you you have for retirement, along with social security to make sure that down the line, you still have enough. So we're looking at what you're taking on the S-Corp side uh, to maximize the tax savings today, but also not robbing the future in the process. And so just jumping into the S-Corp is not always the right move, but then once you've reached a certain level, uh, then it becomes very valuable. Uh, and then the only other caveat with the S-Corp is uh, you need a lot better bookkeeping. You need to be really buttoned up on that front because uh, the potential for audit increases greatly. Awesome. So we're getting some good questions in our yeah. chat. Um, do you have a percentage of business income that you recommend for a salary draw? So I, it's really hard for me to do a percentage. I know that like typically what we come across, and this is a very vague answer. I'm not a CPA. So uh, what uh, how I typically sort of go about it is uh, when once the person is making more than 80,000, that's when we really start to evaluate whether or not the S Corp uh, makes a lot of sense. And 80,000 is just kind of a reasonable number that you might make as a therapist if you are in-house somewhere. Um, it may be adjusted depending on how long you've worked. Uh, so if you are 20 years into the business, maybe you can start, at, you maybe have to start a little higher. If you're brand new, you may be able to start a little lower, but from a from the standpoint of that, it, it's kind of a balance and you kind of want to stay pretty close to that. Awesome. Very similar to how we answer questions in our bookkeeping and taxes one-on-one. It really depends sometimes. Yeah, yeah I know. So. And, and that That is like the ultimate question. How much can I take? And it, we, you know, we wish like the IRS gave us a very clear answer to that and they do not. So. Well, um, so one more question here. If your social, social security earnings are low, are you better staying a sole prop? So sole prop, um, my, like, when you're talking about sole prop, it really depends on the client level. Uh, once you have a decent number of clients, I would strongly advise kind of shifting to the PLLC model just because, or LLC, depending on your state, but just because you're getting those separations from the business personal, you could potentially build credit. Um, the thing is with the, when you're filing taxes, until you make any money, um, the IRS doesn't recognize you at all. And then the moment you make a dollar, if you don't have, if you haven't signed up for anything, they recognize you as a sole prop, um, but you're not getting any of the benefits that an LLC or an S-Corp pro can provide. It's a little cheaper, obviously, because you're not going through the process of um, uh, getting the corporate papers in order. But uh, nonetheless, like once you've gotten past like, a, you know, more than a few clients, you really might want to consider the LLC or PLLC in that case. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Yep. All right. Uh, we good to move to the next question or the next slide? Yep. Let's do it. Okay. So long-term tax planning. And so I know HERD has a lot of tax planning tools um, that really evaluate the, uh, you know, the taxes for this year and whatnot. And uh, I'm not going to touch on that. 
uh, what we really focus on, we, you know, when I'm financial planning, like I'm making sure like CPAs or a service like her is catching all the things that they need to catch, but I'm also looking at the long-term tax plan. And so what we're also evaluating is basically your lifetime tax payments. Uh, like how much taxes are you going to pay in a lifetime? Um, and, you know, honestly, we want that to be as low as possible. Um, a lot of times when people come to us, they're like, can you help me avoid taxes? And it's not, we're not avoiding taxes. Essentially, what we're doing is we're minimizing taxes based on the tax code. Uh, you know, government, the U.S. Uh, Congress passes laws, and within those laws are tax laws. And within those tax laws are different deductions and things that you can take that they want to encourage. They want to encourage self-employment. They want to encourage uh, business growth. And so we look for ways to save on those things, not without like, you know, you know, getting a, uh, um, another entity in the Caribbean Island or something like that, uh, that we're, you know, we're not, we're not so much looking at that, but we're looking at sort of how much you're spending on taxes through your life. And so in different areas uh, of the finances, uh, we address this. Um, so we're looking at investments, right? So we're evaluating how are you investing? What are you investing? Are you uh, taking too much taxes today on things that could be growing uh, better if you weren't paying taxes on it and it was staying inside your investment accounts? So we'll be looking at that. Are they properly invested? It, kind of within that conversation, we're also looking at retirement accounts. So this is, are they invested as a Roth IRA where you're taking the tax now versus the tax later? Or is it better as like a regular 401k or an IRA where the tax break really comes uh, uh, now versus the future? Um, you know, and within both of those, the, the, the portfolio is growing and so you're not getting taxed on the portfolio growth, but depending on whether it's Roth or a regular IRA or 401k, it, it will dictate whether you're getting taxed when you're taking them out. And what we want to look at is, does that make sense? Are your tax rates going to be higher when you're older or are they are going to be higher now? And depending on that balance, determine what type of retirement accounts you're investing in. And so that's really where a lot of that analysis comes from. And that becomes really important the closer you are to retirement because we're really evaluating that uh, heavily uh, around then when you're actually going to be closer to um, recognizing those tax experience, that tax uh, hit or experience or whatever. Uh, business strategies already mentioned. That's kind of the analysis of the S Corp and those sorts of things. Um, but then other assets, like, again, we're not just the business. So we have houses. We might have partners that have stock options. We might have uh, real estate. Um, and so we need to evaluate, are these housed in the best way possible? When are we incorporating them into our finances? And when's the best time for us to pay taxes on these things? Because we might, while we may eventually have to pay taxes, we just want to do it at the most optimal time. That's really for that. Any questions on that one? Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Um, one question about your services. Do you offer both professional and personal services? Yeah. So when I work with clients, I, uh, you know, some have come to me and said, Hey, I only want you to evaluate the business and I can do that. Uh, I much prefer working both sides um, because as I said, this, this balance between the personal and business is um, very hard to avoid. And uh, um, I, I, you know, like, when we're talking about a year long engagement with someone, while when they come to me, they might be most concerned about their business six months down the line, they may be most concerned about where they want to live next. And so I'd rather be able to uh, work with them on both those things as opposed to just one thing. Makes sense. Um, can you share information about long-term care insurance? So long-term care insurance is um, not so Long-term care insurance, when it came about, was an awesome thing. It was saying, hey, here, give us a little bit money now, and you can have as much coverage as you need for as long as you need. I had a grandma who lived in, in a uh, nursing home for about 10 to 12 years 
had a long-term care insurance plan that she paid like nothing for, and it paid for the entire thing. Uh, the, the problem was insurance has realized their mistake and they have increased the cost of long-term care insurance incredibly at, while also reducing the amount of coverage it provides. So it's not something that I say never get, but what I work with clients on is try to build other ways to afford that long-term care through the portfolio um, and, and the business and whatnot. So when the time comes, you need those assets is coming from that as opposed to a very expensive insurance plan. Uh, that is almost, that's like the last, um, the last solution, in my opinion. Awesome. And then one more question here. Um, and this is a ta tax question, so feel free to, um, we can also answer this sure. email if, if needed. Um, I am now a sole proprietor with no W-2 earnings. All of my income is from 1099 or private pay private pay clients. Is it still beneficial for my husband and I to file our taxes jointly or would it be more beneficial for me to file married but separately? Mm -hmm. um, you'll have the the married jointly separately. That is going to be a discussion for whoever is doing your taxes. Uh, there are definite, uh, like there are higher um, deductions allowed if you're doing jointly. And so without knowing anything, just generally speaking, I typically am guiding people towards jointly, not your situation, because I, I can't speak to that because I don't see the full full exposure, but uh, that's typically where I would guide people. Um, the one thing I will say, you're a sole proprietor, you have 1099. If you have 1099 income, you can create an LLC. You can have all that income go to your LLC. You can build retirement accounts through that LLC that way. Um, and so, you know, just because you're working independently like that, all of this stuff applies to you uh, just because you don't have like a private practice. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Yep. Um, so retirement, I forgot I'm, I'm the one managing this. <laughs> um, so uh, quick question on this on, for, before we get into retirement uh, planning, uh, for those who have um, started a private practice, what type of retirement plan do you have? Uh, do you have a solo 401k, a SEP IRA, anything like that? SEP IRA, Roth IRA, 401k. Um, someone is still looking into what would be best to set up um, or haven't been able to start them up. Okay. Yeah. Having, um, having a retirement plan like this, uh, people get hung up on, should I have this one? Should I have that one? Which one should I have? Um, most important, have something, you know, um, until, especially until you have um, employees, because when you have employees, it gets real complicated. Uh, because if you have the wrong thing, you might be forced into providing funds for the retirement. But when you're starting out, uh, if you're a solo practice and you're avoiding the, the topic because uh, you don't know which one to pick, um, I would, you know, move forward with something because it's, it's very important for you to be saving for retirement because I, I consider retirement as kind of the passive income stream that uh, more therapists need to take advantage of. Um, because what happens is when you are funding a retirement account, say, let's say a solo 401k, you are putting money aside from your revenues uh, into this account that's going to grow to a, you know, hopefully a very large amount by the time you are um, older. Meanwhile, you're not paying uh, taxes on that money as it grows. You're, uh, you're not doing anything. You're not like working for that money. So it becomes this like passive income stream that you don't use now, you use in the future. But when, as that's growing, you're going to see your wealth grow as well. So now your net worth is growing, even as your business may or may not be taking off um, to where you want it. And that's going to give you a lot of strength in your financial picture. So when you're like, oh, I want to take another step to grow my business, you're, you, you may feel more confident in that decision because it's not an all or nothing thing. You're not suddenly risking your entire financial picture on this one investment for the business because you have your retirement uh, growing on the side. You know, meanwhile, depending on whether you're, you're taking the taxes today or taxes, you know, making it tax-free in the future, um, 
you're getting, if you could be getting a tax break today. And so that can be really valuable as well. Say you're um, kind of on the edge of whether you should do a regular 401k or a Roth 401k. Right now, your regular 401k, suddenly you, you're able to put you know $10,000 into that solo 401k. You're not getting taxed on that $10,000 today. That's going to save you um, some tax savings come quarterly estimates as well as the end of the year. So that's why this passive income stream can be very valuable because it's a tax savings tool. It's for the future. Uh, it builds your wealth. And really, it's investing in you because you're the one that's going to need this down the line. Um, I talk to therapists that want to work till they're 90. And I talk to therapists that want to retire by 55. And the one common denominator is it doesn't matter how long you want to work. You don't want to be forced to work. And that being forced to work when you're 75, 80 is going to hurt a lot more than, than working now. So, uh, you know, creating a plan for that and using the retirement tools at your disposal are, is really important on that front. Awesome. So we've got a lot of good questions here yeah. is should I be contributing to my retirement with my business or personal accounts? Uh, so by assuming you have an LLC, it's a pass-through entity. And so whether you're uh, doing it through the individual or the personal, you're going to get some tax benefits from it. But through the LLC, you can create what's called a solo 401k or potentially a SEP IRA. Um, and they're going to have higher... Um, levels that you can invest uh, with. So uh, I believe it's 22.5 right now uh, in the solo 401k. And so you can move that, is it 25 or 22.5? Uh, I'll, I'll let her fact check me there because I forget the exact number. But, <laughs> um, and uh, and so you can put that away and, and it's an immediate tax savings of that amount. And, and so that's more than what you could do in a personal account, say like an IRA, or a Roth IRA, well, not a Roth IRA because you're paying taxes on that, but you can only put 6,500 in that if you're under 50 years old. Awesome. And this is a really interesting question. Um, what are some common splits you've seen between a business owner, um, one employee, or maybe a partner? 40, 40, 40, 20, 50, 30. Um, what is considered high growth for business? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the high growth for business line, but uh, Splits, I mean, that's who, how much are you putting into the business? Um, and how much are the other people putting into the business? Whatever that total is, that should be your split. So if you're putting in, you know, 50% of the value of the business, you should get 50% ownership of that business. The one, um, you know, the one caveat is if it's just two people and it's 50-50, uh, you just need a way to break a tie in those situations. Uh, because you don't want, and when it's just two people, it's not too difficult. Like they're typically friends of some sort and they can kind of work through things. But uh, if it gets like five people, they all have 20%. There needs to be a way to break a tie um, or six people, I guess, uh, split evenly. They need a way to break a tie. So having a way to break a tie is probably more important there than anything else. Awesome. And then um, Mike, thanks for clarifying this. It says in 2023, you can contribute up to 22,500 pre-tax yeah, dollars to your solo 401k. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it gets, it, you don't get the full tax benefits, um, but you can actually put for those who are, you know, really starting to see their growth, uh, their wealth grow, that you can actually put about 61,000 into that account on your own if you'd like to. Awesome. And this one is for some of the therapists who haven't started planning for retirement. Um, what would, be what would you recommend as the first step to planning for retirement? Where do I where do I go? How do I research? Um, what do I do? Well, you could contact me, uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, but also, uh, I, you know, what I'll do on that one is I will send a link to Brittany after the conversation so she can add it to uh, the the recap email if that's possible, Brittany. Hey, um, of course. And, uh, you know, my belief is start with that solo because uh, it's there, it has the most um, benefits, uh, you know, if you're looking between personal and business, but it really is going to 
generally depend on your own situation. So I don't want to say definitely go that route, but that's typically where, um, yeah, I guide people. Awesome. Cool. Um, and we can go ahead and move forward there. Okay. How are we doing on time? Cause I have no idea on time right now. Very good. Don't... We're at, um, 1235. Okay. Perfect. Actually. Or 335 uh, for you. <laughs> okay. No, no, that's perfect. Um, so this one, uh, the potential in succession planning, this is a topic that I, um, I would say is one that I am very passionate about uh, because I see so little of it in uh, the space right now. Um, one thing when we're looking um, out at the uh, landscape of the US and demographics and whatnot, what we're seeing is a large group of people about to retire. And we see a very large group of people coming into their professional careers. And what this does is create an opportunity uh, for those who are ready to step away from the business, as well as an opportunity for those who want to fast forward their way into a private practice. Um, and this goes, this is true with therapy as it is with a law firm, a um, uh, financial planning firm, uh, any sort of professional services firm of some sort where uh, there's clients and it can be passed on to uh, someone else. Um, and I know there's a, there's there's reasons why that this isn't as common of a tool within the therapy space. One, there's a lot of solo practices practices out there. Uh, there's um, uh, you know the the therapy space may not have as large just as a whole large of of income, but it doesn't matter. Like there are ways to structure um, business purchases in this in this field uh, to allow for the business to fund the purchase essentially, um, allowing that younger person to move in and that older person to move out. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't handle the legal aspect of it, but I see the financial impact of it, uh, the numbers impact. And I can't, I've talked to those who are 70 years old, still practicing, making, let's say $130,000 a year, uh, don't quite know if they have enough to retire on. And honestly, it's right close to the edge of whether they'll be successful, depending on how, how long they live. And the simple use of a, a sell of their private practice, if they were able to shift it in a way that could, it could be sold, say for like, let's just say 200,000. So just a little bit more than one time salary uh, would be that difference. It would go from maybe not doing so well in retirement to thriving in retirement. And so this is not a short-term thing. It takes uh, a long time to turn a practice into something that can be uh, eventually sold, but it can be really valuable in the, the therapy space. Uh, my wife, personally, I mean, she had a therapist who passed away. Family definitely could have used the funds. Uh, it took her three years to find a new therapist. Um, building ways to uh, allow your clients to transition as well as allow a, a younger uh, therapist to move in and practice the way you want them to practice because you'd be their guide in this can be really valuable. And so um, I can talk a little bit about the tax advantage, like advantageous strategies for that. Um, so example of this is called what's called the installment sale. And so let's say you're going to uh, sell um, a practice for $200,000. The installment sale would say, okay, what we're going to do is have 20% down. So your buyer would put up, let's say $40,000 in this case. Then after that, every year they would provide a either a quarterly payment, a monthly payment, or uh, a yearly payment to that sale. And um, it would have interest. And so they're basically using the income of the business to then buy the rest of the business. And so now uh, you have a tool that's funding that sell. It's not all coming from the individual therapist, um, but also when you are sitting in retirement, collecting that sale, you're not pulling your money out of retirement accounts. And the income you're receiving is not 200,000 all at once that then immediately has to go to the IRS. Instead, you're receiving say $40,000 plus interest. 
uh, which has a lot lower tax rate. So it has uh, multiple advantages for those uh, in a position to sell. You know, uh, you can't just immediately as a private practice owner say, I'm going to sell. Uh, you have to have a marketing arm around that where it's not just your name and some letters. Uh, it has to be an entity and you have to have built a sort of funnel to get new clients in and whatnot and be consistent there. Uh, but, you know, when the time comes, if you pick the right successor, your, your uh, clients will have already seen that person on your website, whatnot. And so when you're ready to step away and they hear, hey, you know, I'm getting older, it's time for me to, you know, look out for retirement, uh, but I have this perfect person to transition to you, uh, to you too, it's going to be a lot easier conversation at that point. Uh, were there any questions on that front? Let me see here. Oh, um, would you mind explaining the difference between uh, SCP and solo uh, retirement oh, plan? Yeah, uh, it, it depends on the, um, it, it, it's, there's limits to how much you can contribute that are different in, an F, in a SEP versus a solo. Um, also, as you're starting to, um, if you are ever to look to build um, like, add therapist to your umbrella. It will add requirements to fund their um, their retirement account if you're funding yours. And so it can force um, force some like uh, some funding that you may not want if you're going to look towards um, towards adding people. So that's why I'm often guiding people to the solo at first, but if I also know that eventually they're going to, and by eventually fairly soon, uh, want to add uh, individuals to their umbrella, then we're evaluating a few different um, retirement plans in that case to make sure that they're not kind of stuck um, funding and not allowed to fund their own at a at a good rate. Absolutely. Yeah, we could do a whole webinar on retirement planning. There's a lot of information there. So definitely yeah. hear your guys' questions. Um, so let me scroll here. Thank you guys for asking questions. It's always nice to have this uh, interactive. Um, okay. This is a good question. Can you change a plan before hiring? Yes. Yeah. And so that's something we also consider just, and it's also why I say, you know, if you're just sitting there and being like, I don't know what, if, what I want to do, should I do it? Um, just, just, I would say typically just kind of uh, move forward as you can. And when then we can adjust, you know, uh, just if I was generally speaking to someone, that's what I would say. You can always adjust the plan down the line. Awesome. Um, and would you say there's financial benefits to bringing on a W-2 clinician to versus a 1099? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's financial and there's um, also just like uh, professional. Um, so one of the, the big aspects of just having a W-2 employee is that this is someone that you trust, you know, they're not Going to going anywhere anytime soon. They're not going to uh, leave you just because they got a. You know they might leave because they got a better offer somewhere, but they're not going to leave you just because you know they have too many clients suddenly and you know they they want to do that. Um, so it creates you have a little bit more loyalty in a W two employee. Um, in terms of the financials, um, there's a lot more that you can write off, but there's also a lot more expenses that you may be uh, required to pay for. Um, so, you know, depending on the size, you may have to pay for um, some healthcare options, or you may have to pay for uh, some retirement funding, um, which could possibly happen in a 1099 employee situation too, but it's more likely in a W-2. Uh, you may also have to pay like um, uh, unemployment taxes and things of that nature. So you definitely want to evaluate the good and bad there. Uh, and that's something I, I I talk to therapists about who are looking for that is we can show them what the cost of an extra employee looks like. And then uh, the way that with the benefits of having a full-time employee by your side. And you can also have them do other things besides client work in that case too. So if you need to, like they can do some marketing, they can do some other things. Awesome. Cool. We can go ahead and move forward here. So that is my last slide before how to reach me. Do, uh, do we want to go to the Q&A? Sure. Yeah, we are at 1245 here. So good on time. Um, do you have any recommendations on health insurance 
um, or ancillary coverage that is cost effective? I, that I can't speak to offhand. Um, you know, there's many different options. You're looking at uh, you're going uh, the private route. You can look at the public options in certain states, um, evaluating those and evaluating that to your own um, health needs is going to be important. Um, you know, what I can say is if you do that through the business, you can you can write off that expense. So make sure to do that. Uh, and then if you choose a high deductible plan, there's a tool called the health savings account, which is the most powerful uh, savings tool out there because you get a, a tax-free contribution. It can grow tax-free. And if you use those funds for health costs, you can then remove it tax-free. So it's called what's, it, what's, what's called triple tax advantage. And it's pretty much the only account out there that's like that. So that's another option for those who don't have uh, super high healthcare costs. Awesome. Um, and can I have both a Roth and a traditional IRA um, and choose how much to put into each? Uh, you can, but you can only put up into 6,500 if you're under 50. So between the two. So if you put 3,000 in one, you can only put 3,500 in the other. Gotcha. Um... Awesome. Let's see. Sorry, just scrolling through the chat here. Um, it's been active. This has been great information, yeah, Ryan. Thank absolutely. you so much. Um, there's a Q and A for. I just don't want to touch it because I don't want to. No, you're everyone, fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and some of these questions we can give to Ryan after. Um, the more complicated ones that are specific to your case, so that um, we can make sure you get your answers there. Um, yeah, yeah, we can go ahead and move forward to the contact form. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, here's my contact form. Um, I'm going to put a plug in for the type of financial planner that I am. So I'm what's called um, a fee only financial planner. And essentially, when you're looking for financial planning services, you have uh, a few different options. You have what's called a commission planner, where they're getting uh, their pay from the commissions of the products that they're selling. So they might be selling life insurance, they might be selling mutual funds of that sort. There's also called a fee-based financial planner where they're, they're charging you a fee, but then they are also getting commissions from um, say a mutual fund or whatever. Um, fee only, the only way I get paid is by my clients. Uh, I do this because it's the only way to ensure that uh, the advice that I'm giving them is fully for them. So when I'm saying insurance, you need this insurance, it's because you th I think you need this insurance to protect yourself. It's not because I'm getting a nice cut uh, you know, behind the back. And, uh, and I bring that up partly because people go many years with their financial planners or investment managers or whoever, not realizing that's how they're getting paid, thinking that, that's, uh, that they don't pay for the service in any way. And it's important to know how you're doing that. Um, so if you're interested in a 20 minute consultation with me, it's free, feel free. You can QR scan uh, that code there and you'll get my calendar. And so you can do that now. You can do that, uh, you know, when you get the herd email as well. Uh, happy to do it and happy to speak with anyone in that way. And then also we have a checklist. Uh, you know, I work for United Financial Planning Group but I do some marketing through a site called thinkingcapfinancial.com slash checklist. If you go there, it's like six or seven things that uh, if you do these things, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Um, and I'll, you just provide your email and you can, you can get that downloaded. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. This was super helpful. Um, and I love this opportunity to schedule a free consultation. We will be emailing everyone the recording. We'll email, um, some more information on how to get in touch with Ryan, just in case you missed this. Um, but thank you so much for coming. This is so great, Ryan. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it anytime. And for everyone out there, thanks for listening. Thanks for letting me drag on for 40 minutes or 50 minutes or so. So I appreciate it and hope to be in touch with, with everyone. Yes. And feel free to either email me or Ryan, if you have any questions and we'll direct you in the, the best way possible. Cool. Have a good day. Bye.